This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 121 is Jungian analyst and author Polly Young Eisendrath in central Vermont. She holds a Master of Arts in Psychology and Mythology from Goddard College and later went on to attend Washington University, St. Louis, where she earned a second master's degree in clinical medical social work and a doctorate in developmental and counseling psychology. Dr. Young Eisendrath trained as a Jungian analyst with the International Association for Analytical Psychology, receiving her degree in 1986. Together with her late husband, Ed Epstein, she created Dialogue Therapy for Couples, outlined in her first book, Hags and Heroes, published by Inner City Books in 1984 and just reissued this year. In 1997, she presented Gender, Myth, and Desire for the sixth annual Fay Lecture Series in Analytical Psychology. Her lectures were published as the book Gender and Desire, Uncursing Pandora, available as a free download from Texas A&M University Press. And in 2011, she sat down with Academy Award-winning screenwriter John Patrick Shanley to take part in the Rubin Museum's Red Book Dialogues. In the fall of 2018, she began the podcast Enemies from War to Wisdom with co-host Eleanor Johnson to explore human hostilities and what to do about them. That same year, she developed Real Dialogue, a method for dealing with opposition and chronic conflict for use at home, at work, and in the world, and in 2022, co-authored the book Dialogue Therapy for Couples and Real Dialogue for Opposing Sides, methods based on psychoanalysis and mindfulness. She has been a lifelong Buddhist practitioner in the Zen, Tibetan, and Vipassana lineages and in 1971, took formal Zen vows with Philip Kaplow Roshi at the Rochester Zen Center. In 2014, she created Enlightening Conversations, a nonprofit organization sponsoring conversational conferences between psychoanalytic scholars and practitioners and Buddhist teachers, as well as scientists conducting research in areas relevant to the conversations between the two traditions. Dr. Young Eisendrath is the founder and director of the Institute for Dialogue Therapy, past president of the Vermont Association for Psychoanalytic Studies, and a founding member of the Vermont Institute for Psychotherapies. Currently, she works as a clinical supervisor and consultant in leadership development at Norwich University and as a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Vermont. She is the author, co-author, editor, and co-editor of many books and articles. Her most recent works are The Present Heart, a memoir of love, loss, and discovery, published in 2014, Love Between Equals, Relationship as a Spiritual Path, published in 2019, and the essay From Akron to Bodhgaya, Suffering and Individuation, published last year in the book Eastern Practices and Individuation, Essays by Jungian Analysts, edited by Episode 113 guest Leslie Stein. Please visit our website, speakingofjung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, June 28, 2023, through the magic of Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us today, Polly. Well, thanks for having me, Laura. I'm really looking forward to this. You and I actually met very briefly back in 2016 when you were here in Chicago to present at the Jung Institute. The title of your talk was Gather Up Your Brokenness, Love, Imperfection, and Human Ideals. And it is actually available on your YouTube channel. And there will be a link to it in the show notes for this episode. I took away so many things from that talk that I still remind myself of to this day. A few of them are, everything is broken. We are rarely conscious. We are from time to time. Other people are irritating. I love that one. 
uh, true love versus love on a one-way street. Uh, stop idealizing your children and grandchildren, which maybe we could talk about some other time. I think we could do a whole episode on that. And that Roshi said, once people start talking, they inevitably start fighting. Which brings me to why I've invited you here today, which is to celebrate the reissue of your very first book, Hags and Heroes, which was published by Inner City Books back in 1984, and it's just been reissued. So I would actually like to start at the beginning. I read that June Singer was one of your analysts. She co-founded the Analytical Psychology Club of Chicago, which later became the Jung Institute of Chicago, and the Clinic for Psychotherapy at the C.G. Jung Center in Evanston is named after her. They offer affordable Jungian-oriented psychotherapy. Uh, she also co-founded the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. So she's done a lot for, for Jungian analysis in the United States. Would you tell us briefly about her? Well, um, you know, I felt very, very lucky to have found her and then to be in analysis with her. And of course, there's, there's a long backstory to everything these days. So I don't want to go into the whole backstory, but largely it was Boundaries of the Soul, her book that brought me to her. And um, I think I probably would not have even entertained being a Jungian analyst had I not been in analysis with June because she suggested it. I was becoming a psychologist uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm a developmental psychologist and later became a clinical psychologist. But June said, you know, I think you should be a Jungian analyst. And I was interested, but would not have felt brave enough to say that's what I wanted to do. And after she said it, then a lot of things unfolded between us including her using um, a couple of my dreams with, with, without asking me permission and my occurring in an article that, that she wrote for, oh gosh, I can't remember the journal, but um, it's, it's a, it's a well-known journal. I may be able to remember the name of it. Um, Parabola. I believe it was Parabola. I think she wrote it for Parabola, but um which occasioned a conversation between me and her that was very interesting and has been in the background of a lot of things that have happened to me with my own patients and uh, using their materials, et cetera, because that is itself uh, a uh, an interesting thing when the therapist uses the material of the client or the patient. So then eventually June and I became friends after I finished my work with her and I ended up in interviewing her about 15 years after I finished with her for my book that's called The Resilient Spirit. In the paperback, it was called The Gifts of Suffering in the hardback. And so I was able to talk to her in greater depth about the death of her daughter, about her really at that time ex-husband's suicide, about what unfolded in her life as the result of those losses and how those losses transformed her. So that comes around again to gather up your brokenness because it was through June's Boundaries of the Soul, which was about her the loss of her daughter uh, that brought me to her. And then my interest in suffering, and I was already a Buddhist by the time I became a Jungian analyst, but then eventually the loss of my husband through early onset Alzheimer's and my deepened interest then in how our brokenness, our wounds, our failures, and our losses wake us up to why we're here and how to be compassionate and how to connect through our brokenness rather than through our accomplishments or our, you know, achievements or even through the successes of our children or grandchildren. I mean, it's much easier for humans to connect through their wounds and brokenness 
because we are inherently flawed, we are inherently imperfect, we are inherently um, impermanent, and we know, we all know we're going to die. And then we are inherently interdependent, which you could say is sort of impersonally connected. So, you know, all of those things in some ways interact with me and June because what brought me to June really was the death of her daughter and the publish the publishing of the boundaries of the soul and then eventually I could ask her lots of questions about that and then eventually I had in my own life a great loss and an extended uh, period of loss so um, all of that is part of my relationship with June Singer. And there's much more, but mm -hmm. that's probably enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I remember when I was in Jungian analysis, I actually entered analysis before I really knew who Jung was. And then over the years, I became more and more interested in Jung's psychology and in what he said and what he wrote. And that was the book that my analyst recommended that I read uh, is June Singer's Boundaries of the Soul. There will be a link to it in the show notes. You wrote an essay that was published last year in the book Eastern Practices and Individuation. And I actually did an episode with the editor, Leslie Stein. It's episode 113. And in it, you refer to yourself as a psychoanalyst, Buddhist, feminist, psychologist, author, and podcaster, as well as a mother, grandmother, and life partner. So you have such a huge body of work, and I loved preparing for this episode. I mean, I have goosebumps saying it because your material speaks to me like, I have to say, like no one else's does. And thank goodness you have provided so much of your work online and accessible to people. So there will be links to all of Polly's websites and books and everything she's doing in the show notes for this episode. Your first book, which is what we are celebrating here today, is titled Hags and Heroes. And the subtitle is A Feminist Approach to Jungian Psychotherapy with Couples. So I'd like to ask you, where does feminism fit in with the psychology of Jung? Um, probably not well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not comfortable necessarily. And there is, again, a lot to say about it. But I think perhaps the biggest question I had when I was becoming a Jungian analyst was, is this concept of the feminine or the great feminine or the archetype of feminine is that projected into women by men who write about this topic mm -hmm. because at that point the let's say originators of these ideas about women somehow expressing the feminine or being allied with the feminine, the writers were mostly men. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I have become increasingly more aware of the importance of who's telling the story, whose lens are we using for understanding, you know, what humans are experiencing and so I noticed as I went through the Jungian training, I wasn't relating to a lot of what was said about femininity and masculinity or the feminine and the masculine. Uh, and I was thrown by that. I was actually, I would say, even distressed by it uh, because I kept feeling like I came from a class background that didn't fit with the typical class background of, in here, I don't want to generalize, but many of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when I did make the trip to Zurich to try to see who are the people there, yeah. well, they were people with an amount of wealth that I had never encountered. 
And that threw me again. Mm -hmm. I was like, did I end up with the wrong folks here? I mean, I started out in the Black Power Movement yeah. in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, I have come from a mixed race family. I'm white presenting. So you can, you know, there are many, many issues about identity that are wrapped up in my background. But um, I felt like when I was growing up, the women around me, were the people that seemed to know everything and control everything. So that was from the nuns to the fact that I didn't see the men most of the time because they were working in factories. So yeah. all of the households were run by women. And my own mother, who was definitely no wallflower, never taught me to be quote unquote feminine and really led me to take Grace Jones as my kind of mentor mm -hmm in terms of how I wanted to transform my suffering into something that was my creativity. And I saw Tina Turner doing that. I saw Grace Jones doing that. I did not see white women doing it very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Horn, I eventually, I came along with that uh, story. But so this whole issue about the masculine and the feminine, I had a lot of questions about. Uh, by the time I wrote Hags and Heroes, and I did it very quickly because I didn't know how to write a book. And um, uh, mm, the head of inner city publications, whose name I'm just... Uh, Daryl Sharp. Daryl Sharp, yes, right, of course. Daryl Sharp came to a talk that I was doing with my husband, Ed Epstein, in, um, I think, Texas, I think we were in uh, Dallas, Texas. And um, he said, well, this is great. This, this framework that you have for doing couples therapy, would you like to write a book about it? And I said, sure, really? And he said, yes, and here's a contract. And so I wrote the book and gave it to him two months later. And he said, wow, you know, how'd you do that? Mm -hmm. And I said, you asked for a book and so here it is and so <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that you need to take time or you needed to interact with the editor later when I started writing books I realized that first book I was writing more from the perspective of uh you know working on a dissertation or something yeah. um but you know by that time I wanted to say certain things to the Jungian world and a lot of those things I could say through the tale of of Sir Gawain and the Lady Ragnell, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful story that gets told in different ways throughout the Middle Ages. But the version that I liked very much was the folk, the folk version. And that is recorded, I think, in the 16th century. There's a record of it that I actually saw at Oxford University. And I think it's meant to be told in the 12th to the 14th it's so it's a folk version and it's a version where the woman is strong and she solves all the puzzles and she does that through her let's say resilience courage straightforwardness willingness to be called a bitch but she goes forward with it and it transforms her and it transforms everyone because she recognizes that she needs her own sovereignty to be beautiful. Like she can't be beautiful unless she can speak for herself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I must say that in the whole Jungian opus, there was a problem with this idea of animus because it was sort of secondary or even less than secondary for Jung. He, he was interested in the anima. Right. And he kind of footnoted, oh, there's an animus. But if you look at those two categories, again, the women get the, the sort of second rate, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the sort of second rate image of an unconscious dynamic connected to their creativity, which is their opinionated and rigid yep. instead of creative and and competent and powerful. Mm. If they're powerful, it's rigidity. So again, all of those things were circulating around in my, you know, really kind of, I would say naive point of view when I was 33 or 34 years old, when I started 
writing Hags and Heroes. And now when I look back at the book, I'm kind of amazed that yeah. I did what I did because no I, i'm sorry I, I jumped in there i mean it is an amazing book and there is uh for the listeners that that are interested in more uh the second chapter is titled feminism and the psychology of cg young well you know i haven't read it recently i, I have to say i probably I, I feel like i've been writing the same book all of my life mm. just from different angles and that may be true for everybody who writes over time i'm i'm trying to get at the same issues again and again and again yeah. So right now my work in real dialogue is is about speaking for yourself and and being able to listen and actually hear somebody before you respond to them and remaining curious as as a way to avoid polarization and end war and I started out in life with a desire to end war and it seems like I'm finishing up on the same trajectory because I would say almost nothing has happened on that issue in my entire life. Mm. And we will get to that, but I just want to circle back for a bit. You were speaking about your background and your upbringing and your mother. And I want to let the listeners know that the essay of yours that I referred to earlier, that's published in the book, Eastern Practices and Individuation, you gave a talk for the AJA the Association of Jungian Analysts last month, which was May of 2023. And it is a video that is available on their YouTube channel. And it's fantastic because you are reading that essay. And again, it's titled From Akron to Bodhgaya, Suffering and Individuation. And Polly, that is one of the best essays I've ever read. Uh, you are so open with your, I mean, just I just identified with so much in it and with your childhood and your school years and your parents and your upbringing and your parents parents and what was hidden and what was revealed and just you becoming you and you sharing all of that is I want to thank you for that and I want to thank the AJA for making that video available you know for free on their YouTube channel and then um Ruth Williams joins for the second half and you talk about all this current research that you're involved with and uh, maybe we can get to that toward the end here today. Uh, so there will be a link to that video in the show notes on this episode page. So you mentioned that the book that we were just speaking about, Hags and Heroes, was your first book on dialogue therapy. Uh, dialogue Therapy for Couples, which you developed with your uh, late husband, Ed Epstein, uh, who you write about in The Present Heart, uh, which I mentioned in the introduction. So would you tell us how Dialogue Therapy kind of developed? You you had it all kind of outlined in the book, Hags and Heroes. How did it come about? Yes, I mean, again, as I look back at it, it it, it truly was, uh, you know, what I would say in a non-trivial way, it was karmic. I mean, it mm -hmm. was forces that were coming together between Ed and me and taking us somewhere that we wouldn't have been able to imagine at the time. And so there was at that time uh, in structural family therapy, um, in Salvador Mnuchin's work particularly, uh, an emphasis on restructuring the family and centralizing the father, particularly in marginalized and poorer families where the father had deserted or left or mm -hmm. or just kind of backed out, out of um, fatigue or whatever. Uh, and in that process of trying to centralize the father, there was this diminishment of the mother. And so often it was, when I when I was I was teaching at Bryn Mawr College at the time, and my students were required to take a training in structural family therapy at the Child Guidance Clinic of Philadelphia, and so and I had to go uh, and watch in a one way mirror many many students uh, in training uh, and watching them in this process of uh, I would say minimizing the woman the mother who had been often the parent who was taking care of the children and was taking responsibility. 
And I understood the logic of what was happening, but I felt that the method was wrong. And so I wanted to create a method where the two partners would be equals uh, in, in a therapy situation. And I also was aware from Jung's um, writing about uh, child psychotherapy that he, he felt very strongly that the problem was often not the child, but the couple. Yeah. And I, I could see that as well. Mm -hmm. I could see that it's not really family therapy. It, it's about the couple and their unconscious dynamics, the ways in which they are not able to handle their conflicts with respect. They're not able to deal with the, let's say, emotional power of each other. Mm -hmm. And consequently, I wanted to make something that had a feminist aspect to it that um, I wanted to make a form of therapy that allowed women to speak for themselves and insisted that the man also listen. Um, and Ed was had his background, it was in psychodrama. He was a clinical social worker and he had a lot of training in psychodrama. So he brought in some of the techniques like we used alter ego, we use role reversal and we set up something that now has been very much formalized in our training of dialogue therapy that is something like an improvisational theater. The couple comes in, there's a strong setup, they talk to each other, then we begin to work with the dynamics and the dynamics are always in some way or another linked to something that Jung called participation mystique. He took that from, I think, the French ethologist, uh, and uh, I would remember his name, and maybe I will, but... Pearl. Uh, yes, Levy Brule. And uh, he, he could sense that unconscious dynamics were uh, infectious um, and that they happened in group situations and in couples, particularly when we're falling in love. But Melanie Klein and then Wilford Bion lifted up these concepts much more and brought them into the conversation on, on psychotherapy, but not necessarily couples therapy through the term projective identification. And so we were interested in breaking up these entangled dynamics that create a kind of pathological symbiosis in many, many couples, it is not rare. And uh, that probably is uh, a byproduct of falling in love, especially mm -hmm. uh, where you idealize, you get entangled in the other person unconsciously through feeling like you're the fairest in the land, but you are going to become you know, the, the worst in the land or at yeah. least the enemy of that person uh, as you try to become equals. So um, so Ed and I were, 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 we were kind of like rolling around in the grass with all of this because we invited couples to come in and help us formulate this thing. And we did it in our living room. When I look back about, you know, it was kind of nutso because we were doing something that was kind of explosive mm -hmm. and we weren't, um, we didn't have people signing legal documents mm -hmm. to say that, you know, we weren't going to harm, harm them or we, if they, whatever. But anyway, what happened was that we did have success and the people that helped us go through that early process were kind of guinea pigs, but we didn't charge mm -hmm. them. And so gradually we formulated this way of working, but then we found this story and I don't remember how I actually thought about the story of Sir Gawain and Lady Ragnell, but I had studied it because I was uh, an English major as it turned out. I mean, I majored in different things as an undergraduate, but I, but I finally ended up in medieval studies and um, I you know, knew Middle English at that time and Old French as it turns out. But um, so I, I knew this story of Sir Gawain and the Lady Ragnell, but I didn't know that the version I knew was principally the one that I was taken by was principally the folk tale uh, because it, it occurs in the Wife of Bath story in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. But in that framework, uh, the meaning of this sovereignty of uh, Lady Ragnell is diminished. So in the folk story, uh, 
Lady Ragnell gets kind of the center stage and she's, and she's really up against King Arthur. So she's up against this huge power structure and she has nothing but her own presence. And she holds to her presence and she holds to her truth throughout the story. And that's what transforms her, even though it looks like, you know, it's Gawain who grants her her sovereignty, but actually sovereignty is interactive. And, you know, you can claim your sovereignty, but if someone else doesn't respect it, 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 it turns out that it doesn't work very well. So, you know, it's like together, Ragnell, who really fights for her own voice, and then Gawain, who recognizes the importance of her voice. He says, you know, I cannot answer for you. Only you can answer. It's mm -hmm. your choice. And then she becomes beautiful through that. Her spirit shines through. And so that story kind of illuminated the whole of dialogue therapy. And then Ed, who had been trained as an actor, mm. could tell the story. So he memorized this story. And when we would do these trainings, he would stand up and do a dramatic rendering of the story and everyone would cry and everyone would react and we would be so delighted by the story, which would set the stage then to set up the the training. Eventually, the, the training was always informal when Ed and I did it, but I wrote another book called You're Not What I Expected, Love After the Romance Has Ended, which uh, came out in 1993 and was more of a of a further development of dialogue therapy. But at, through all of that time, we informally taught dialogue therapy to uh, therapists who had uh, a partner, typically it was a spouse, who wanted to learn how to do therapy with couples because at that point, dialogue therapy required two therapists. It was a co-therapy mm -hmm. model, but um, overall, I would say dialogue therapy, which evolved from many different influences, was creatively the product of that story. Mm -hmm. And the story was, in fact, I wouldn't have been thinking about bringing in a story were I not in training. I was still in training to be a Jungian analyst. I hadn't become an analyst yet mm -hmm. when I wrote Hags and Heroes. But it was as though a force came through and just brought all these influences together, which then in various ways became my life's work, uh, both from the side of women's development and feminism and from the side of, uh, you know, avoiding polarization and hopefully ending the absolute drive to make an enemy. Humans have such a strong drive to make enemies because we want to blame somebody for what's wrong here in you know human life but what is wrong in human life is not uh anybody's fault it's not no one is doing it we're in an environment that cannot be perfected and we keep thinking it's because of our parents it's because of the spouse it's this thing it's that and so you know, we have this nature to create enemies. So it's like Hags and Heroes was the beginning of something that now I have a book that came out in 2022 called Dialogue Therapy for Couples and Real Dialogue for Opposing Sides. And it's a training book for people who are becoming dialogue therapists and real dialogue specialists but now I'm writing another book uh, called Depolarized. At least that's the working title, Humanizing Our Conflicts. And so, you know, it's just like, it, it seems to me, you know, I'm working on this same book <laughs> that was really was Hags and Heroes and then has become a lot of things because I've written about women's development. And for years, I specialized only in doing therapy with women and then doing the couples therapy with Ed. I'm interested in something you just said. You you said we have this nature to create enemies. And, you know, I, I don't know that I'd ever heard anybody say it like that before. That is so true. And 
do you notice, I want to ask you just briefly, do you notice a difference between our culture here in the United States and other cultures throughout the world? Is it different here? Is it more so here? Or is this well, human nature? It's human nature. There is not a culture that does not do this. And I, and I will tell you why briefly, because there's a lot of argument that comes up about this, okay. particularly in regard to indigenous peoples and so on. But this tendency, this projective identification is a product of this long infancy that we have as humans in which we don't have language or culture, but we have to bring other people under our control because we are so dependent on caregivers to get our needs met mm -hmm. from the interuterine. So we come in inside of person interuterine, we start discriminating the mother's voice four months interuterine. Mm. We are born, we have to see the face of our caregiver. They have to see our face. And we have to start communicating through our primary emotions in order to get our needs met immediately. And we don't develop language until after the age of two and between 18 months and two years old we're developing these self-conscious emotions in which we are learning to protect ourselves and promote ourselves. We learn to compare ourselves with others. So it's, it's, it's emotions like, you know, jealousy and envy and pride and shame and guilt and embarrassment, self-pity, all those emotions come online universally. So universally humans develop a separate self and that happens by the time we get to be about two years old and two-year-old two year people everywhere are power-oriented people. They are I, me, mine people because they have to be. Mm -hmm. It's our design. And so all of us build our entire lives on top of that design. So we always compare ourselves to others when we're in groups, including a couple, and we always promote ourselves mm -hmm. and we're always looking to identify with the good and powerful and to project the bad and difficult. But we're in a situation where we cannot escape the bad and difficult. Mm -hmm. And we know that from the age of four or so on. And um, all of this, it's taken me a long time to work this out, believe me. I mean, I started with a, I started with a sense of not understanding why people couldn't get along. Um, and I certainly, once I understood what war was, I couldn't believe that humans killed strangers. You know, I, I, I grew up in a family where there was a lot of domestic violence uh, and it was never really much directed at me, mm -hmm. but I saw a lot of it. And I heard a lot of people say, I'll kill you if you do that. But I didn't think that it really happened until I heard about war when I was about seven. Um, so overall, in any culture, this issue of wanting to find an enemy and to vanquish that enemy is going to be alive and well, because every human has had this extended infancy, and we all know how to bring other people under our control emotionally. We know how to evoke and project various things that will set us up to protect ourselves and promote ourselves. And that's a design feature. That's not a bug, it happens everywhere. And it just gets, it gets language differently and there are different aspects, say in Asia, people identify more with their families, mm -hmm. with their tribe essentially, than they do with their little individual bodies, okay. you know? And so in, in those cultures, you'll have the pride will be in the family and there will be honor to maintain in the family and people are willing to lie to maintain that honor. Mm -hmm. In the West, there tends to be the sense of individual responsibility. And we believe that lying is not a good way to protect our individual power, even though we use lying, uh, because it, it erodes our ability to negotiate with each other as individuals. Lying will actually tear the social fabric. And so uh, again, you know, I, and here these are kind of stereotypes, but they work pretty well. Uh, it, in order to see into this deeply, I would suggest uh, the book, The Geography of Thought. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, also uh, another book called Tiger Writing, not, not the Tiger Mother book, but Tiger Writings by Gish Jen, and, um, who teaches at Harvard. And the Geography of Thought uh, is by a psychologist uh, whose name I'm not remembering at the moment, but it's okay. I'll it's look it up and I'll I'll put it in the you show can, notes. You can put it on your on the podcast. So you know, basically, what I'm trying to summarize here mm -hmm. is that within the human archetype of self, this whole issue is built in of you being self conscious, protecting yourself, promoting yourself, and defending yourself, and to do that in a world that cannot be perfected. You have to, in some way or another, find somebody else to blame for the situation you're in. And on top of that, because of our perceptual systems, we all have confirmation bias. That is, we tend to confirm our beliefs as we hold them. And what's called negativity bias, we remember what's wrong and what doesn't work more than we remember what's right and what does work. And these things are well proven across a lot of research in cognitive science. So um, the typical way that in, so you ask about America, are things sort of worse in America mm -hmm. than other places? The one thing that is much worse here is the, this, I mean, again, I'm boiling this down, but we make sure. most of our money on making weapons in America, particularly right now, because we've, we've sent a lot of manufacturing of other things elsewhere, but we still make a lot of weapons and we sell those weapons to our enemies as well as our friends. And um, those weapons are uh, weapons, you know, not, not nuclear, but they are, weapons of mass destruction. And so we tend to uh, benefit from wars here. And I think we're in roughly 117 wars right now, uh, America is, and we have bases all over the place and people just don't pay attention to that anymore. Right. It's become so every day. Uh, yeah. So in America, what we do is we market war. And in that way, we're worse than our military budget is something like 10 times the military budget of Russia, uh, maybe 10 times the military bu budget of China. There's one, I mean, we're 10 times the military budget of one of those countries and three times the military budget of the other one. I, I'm not sure which one is which, but we're way over uh, the military sort of arming uh, than, you know, a, we're way, way above any other country and we market it. You know, we're, we're basically selling this stuff. So it's like we sell war here and that's a little different from most places. So I don't know, that's a long answer, but um, so it's, you know, we are of the nature to destroy ourselves. That's in Terminator 2. Uh, the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger says, mm -hmm. answers the, the little boy protagonist and says, you know, you're a, the boy says basically, we're not going to make it, are we, people? I mean, and Schwarzenegger says, well, you're of the nature to destroy yourselves. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's our nature. And it is fundamentally our nature. So we need to become aware of it on the good side. Humans, uh, self awareness is what distinguishes them. We are aware of our awareness. We can stop doing things even mid mid-action we can stop and so we could stop creating war we just haven't i read in that essay that i referred to earlier you said that writing and teaching about couples developing skills to transform difficult conversations and polarizations is my current anti-war work and yes. i love that because we <laughs> We want peace on earth, but we don't have peace in our home and we don't know how to get along with each other. And the solution is divorce, divorce, divorce for couples. So developing skills, right, uh, to communicate 
And this is what dialogue therapy is. Now, what is real dialogue? So I'll answer that, but I want to say something first, because again, now I have refined my way of speaking about these things by teaching so much. So the, the issue is not communication. That's what couples will come to dialogue therapy or couple therapy for. They'll say, well, our communication is bad. But really, often these are very articulate people, <laughs> very sure. educated people. It's not communication. It's dehumanization. Ah. So what disrupts couples and it disrupts anyone who's in a polarizing situation, including nations, is the dehumanizing of the other side. And so really what dialogue therapy and real dialogue teach, and I'll, I'll talk about real dialogue in a moment, is the humanizing of conflict so that you are able to speak for yourself and listen to another without turning them into an enemy, which means objectifying them. Like if you don't experience your partner as being a human being like yourself with vulnerabilities and limits mm -hmm. and a background mm -hmm. and wounds, you're dehumanizing that person. They're no longer vulnerable like you are. And then of course, that's what we do in racism, slavery, war. We dehumanize the other person. And then we feel somehow justified mm -hmm. in treating them really badly, including killing them. And so yeah. that is the issue, is the dehumanizing of other people when you're in conflict with them. And it isn't really a communications problem. It's a problem attribution or projection about the other person's motives and intentions. And once you learn to break that habit, you can do it even when you're under stress. Uh, and so dialogue therapy teaches uh, couples. We teach the couples first by taking a fairly elaborate history that the partner is the observer of. And so the, they have, the partner has to listen to the history of the other person's view of the relationship as well as their family of origin or any other major relationships. And the person interviewing the dialogue therapist person is empathic with the person they're interviewing. So the partner's having to listen to this and often has a very different sense of who this person is. Even from that opening interview, each person is interviewed in the evaluation. So then each person sees the other person's primary wounds in a, in a very empathic way. Mm -hmm. Then we put them into the dialogue. They have to learn to use the skills with a partner where they've typically had a habituated uh, projective identification or polarization. So, you know, couples have usually engaged in polarization over a long period of time before they come to couple therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so then I'll talk about real dialogue. So, okay. you know, over these recent years, I would say the last 10, maybe fewer. So I started coming back to teaching dialogue therapy in 2016. Um, Ed died in 2014. He became um, diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in 2009. Uh, he was 59. And it probably started setting on for him when he was 54, but mm -hmm. it was confusing at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so I took a break from dialogue therapy. I just couldn't do it without him. The whole area of my books and everything, I, I didn't think I'd ever go back to them again because mm -hmm. I thought because Ed and I created this, it, it just was too overwhelming for me sure. emotionally to take it on. And so I backed away for about 10 years and then around 2015, 16, I had referred a lot of people to emotion focused therapy, including my son in Ottawa, and it wasn't working. And I saw that it was emphasizing secure attachment. It really wasn't 
emphasizing accurate witnessing. And I realized that, you know, dialogue therapy was emphasizing accurate witnessing. So I thought I'm going to have to go back to this. I've got to, I've got to do it differently because I'm without Ed now. And so I began teaching it differently and I began professionalizing it because before it was more like, almost like a hobby that Ed and I had for teaching other married couples how to do dialogue therapy and people learned it and couples therapists learned from it, et cetera. But I professionalized it, began training uh, larger numbers of people and people from different backgrounds in dialogue therapy. And then with my then co-therapist, Jeannie Pinyaz, we wrote the book on dialogue therapy. Mm -hmm. But in that period of time, we, we, we all, as a culture, we're moving through a lot of things. Uh, of course, um, COVID comes in there, but that wasn't so much affecting, except there were a lot of polarizations around vaccination. But it was, for me, it was the DEI space of uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion was coming in in terms of anti-racism, but it was coming in in a way that was polarizing. Again, I could mm -hmm. see that. And so I, I thought, and Jeannie and I together thought in writing the book on dialogue therapy, we were like, we can bring dialogue therapy into this domain of anti-racism. Uh, and we can use the skills that the couples learn and just kind of pull those out. And it won't any longer be a therapy. It'll be more like instructions in, in humanizing conflict. So that's the final chapter of the book that's called Dialogue Therapy for Couples and Real Dialogue for Opposing Sides. Chapter 10 really looks at this method of facilitating a difficult conversation, which we call you know, real dialogue facilitation, and then using these three skills, speaking for yourself, listening mindfully, remaining curious as the key to these facilitating um, situations. So over time, I've been teaching the skill and we have we have a um, an app called realdialogue.com. It's a free app, www.realdialogue.com uh, for teaching. And that's a relatively new app. We've had a lot of bugs. It's incredible. Michael Berger created it. We bootstrapped our way up and it is us usable. But we hope to develop further and a kind of, I'm hoping to develop a nonprofit and then an app that's animated that really teaches by feedback. So teaching real dialogue skill to the general public and to people that are having difficulties, that's one of the, let's say, goals that I have and my mm -hmm. team has. Um, and then teaching this method of facilitating difficult conversations and we've been teaching it um, as a part of, or let's say interactive with teaching dialogue therapy. And I've been doing that. I started doing it before COVID, put it on hold, and now doing it again in person, mostly in Vermont. Although I've done, I have taught Montreal, California, um, New Jersey, uh, and none of those trainings finished though because of COVID. So okay. I've done these com completed trainings in Vermont uh, and probably we'll be moving those out to other places, but people can look at my website. We will be, we just are finishing a cycle of training in Vermont and we're going to start another cycle. So what I'm hoping is that real dialogue as a facilitated conversation, which can be facilitated by someone who's not a professional mental health person, or it can be a mental health person, but it's okay. not a requirement. Dialogue therapy, you have to be a, a mental health professional okay. because you're dealing with interpretation. You're dealing also with psychopathology, a lot of things. The, the real dialogue part of it, it, it can be used in the situation even where the facilitator just walks into the room and is told there's this thing going on. There's a setup for it. We use a number of the methods that come from dialogue therapy, like alter ego, well, reversal, some parts of the evaluation, but we're really teaching these skills and these the skills of speaking for yourself, listening mindfully, remaining curious that interestingly go back to Hags and Heroes. 
lives. You know, the whole sort of framework, this is what amazes me about life is the way mm. life is, the way life is designing you. You know, it's like, you're not designing your life, but your life is designing you. And, uh, and so Hags and Heroes and the story of Lady Ragnell and Sir Galloway were kind of, those, those characters were kind of designing what I was doing back in 1983 and they're still designing what I'm doing now mm. and that's that's really really remarkable thank you so much for your time today Polly I really appreciate it and hope to have you back in the near future when your new book is released well Laura this is really an honor and it's an honor that you prepared as thoroughly as you did that's not always the case and I know I've taken a really deep dive. I hope that listeners have been able to follow me in that dive. And I do plan to talk to you again. I look forward to talking to you again. So thank you so much for your preparation and your care. Thank you again. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, available to stream or download commercial-free. This podcast is also available on our YouTube channel, Jungian Laura. With special thanks to Scott Milligan, Dave Sharp, and Liz Jefferson at Inner City Books, and in memory of Daryl Sharp, I'm Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.